And now, something completely different. Watch us on YouTube. Listen on your favourite podcast platform. Or ask your smart speaker to play the podcast Lester Till I Die. Subscribe, like, follow and join in now. Strap yourself in. Because we're set up, switched on and ready to go. on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This podcast is proud to be part of the TalkSport Fan Network. TalkSport. Powered by fans. Right, Chris. All right, good evening. How the devil are we all? Welcome along. It's been a while since we've done one of these. Um, and I thought, you know what? That young Stephen that comes on to the prediction show with us, you know, the one that doesn't like Tottenham or Arsenal, that's the one, yeah. I thought, you know, we've done all these prediction shows, we've never had a chat about his career, and obviously his time at Leicester. So that's what we're going to do tonight. So we're going to have a chat with him first of all, and then please, please, if you've got any questions for him, stick them in the chat. We'll have a bit, a bit of time at the end when um, I can put some of your uh, your questions to him. Uh, I'm sure Anthony will be joining us, so he will be asking who was his favourite Arsenal player that he played against, in what did what was his favourite Arsenal team, and what does he think about Tottenham Hotspur? We will go into that, I'm sure, as well. But it is great to welcome along. Like I say, it was my period. It was my time when I started. Uh, getting into Leicester City, um, because he was part of the team that also included a certain Mr Lineker, who was in the same class as myself. We were in the same, I was certainly in the same maths group. Whatever happened to him? I always wondered. But let's, let's bring him in and say a very, very good evening to Steve. Good evening, sir. How the devil are you? I'm fine, thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. Good, 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 good. Um, obviously, um, you, you you do the prediction shows with us, but you are branching out into into clothing. And when I say clothing, ladies and gentle folk, I obviously don't mean you know like you know the uh, the underwear department or anything like that. But it's Foxy Seven, and uh, it's coming soon. It is, mate. Yeah, um, it was created by my daughter. To be honest, uh, to be honest. Uh, She's 16 and she's into the art world and photography. And um, I've got a lazy 21-year-old son who um, <laughs> doesn't want to work. So we got together and she came up with this um, nice little idea and this nice little thing of a, a clothing line for him, and she called it Foxy 7. So um, we've gone along with it and it's, it's created a lot of interest so far. So hopefully, um, you know, we're going to start off at the end of the month and uh, see how it goes. Really? Well, as I say, you're on the show every week with us with the prediction. We will be announcing it and um, pushing it for you as soon as uh, as soon as you launch it. So um, keep watching the channel, and we will keep you updated with that. Um, you were just a little bit older than me, only a few years. I hate and I hasn't to say. I think I, I, we said that I think you've aged better than me. Um, <laughs> Born uh, West Bromwich, uh, which, of course, you can tell from the accent uh, where, where, what part of the Midlands you were from. Um, how did you get into the football? I mean, obviously, I presume it was through school, was it? 
Yeah, um, we had a school team um, called Churchfields, and we went into the Birmingham Boys League uh, on a Sunday. And um, Aston Villa youth were in there, and they hadn't been beaten for about five years. Right. And uh, we absolutely hammered them. We beat them 4 1 in the first game, and then 5 way, 5 1 uh, away in the second game of the season. And then um, they showed interest. But my dad, bless him, um, growing up, I could say bloody and bugger in the house. But if I ever said Villa or Wolves, I used to get a slap. And then, <laughs> and then he wasn't too happy when Villa started showing interest. Mm. And then after the Villa started to show an interest, that's when West Brom became interested. Mm. And um, being born in West Brom and that and whatever and following them all my life, you know, it was great and I went there. And uh, your dad's obviously a huge West Brom fan. Um, I remember when mine was old enough, we actually lived in Burnley at the time, and I remember saying to him, look, you know, it'd be great if you supported Leicester because that's my team, but, you know, we don't live in Leicester. If you did really want to support Burnley, I'd understand it because you live in Burnley, but you're not supporting Man United, Chelsea, Liverpool or any of the big teams just because they're always on the telly. But... Um, even then was sort of because obviously you know we, we know you as 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 the speedy winger that you were uh even at that stage was that the position you were you were playing in no i started off as a sweeper um i got the ball to the back and then i just used to get the ball from the back and just run with it mm. and i had a, a few goals uh playing on a saturday and a sunday and it wasn't until i went to west bromwich uh albion that the coach then decided to put me out on the wing and um, I'll, I'll never look back after that. The rest, as they say, is history. You, know? <laughs> um, you joined as an apprentice and um wasn't long. You, you, you won a trophy. Yes. Um, we've still got the record up to this day now, um, FA Youth Cup. Uh, we, we won it in 76, um, which was, you know, absolutely great, fantastic. Mm. Um, I met some good friends, made some enemies who became friends after. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about that one after. But um, that was the start for it. For it, um, at the club at the time, the manager was Johnny Giles. Mm. And, um, you had a few Irish internationals playing there: uh, Eamon Dunphy, Ray Tracy, um, Martin Henderson, and it's Johnny Giles. Johnny that had been at Leeds under Cluffy, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. 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 And um, he went back to Ireland and he brought. He started off the first professional club. He brought Shamrock Rovers. And oh. it was it was all non-league then and uh, no, no, you know, part-time players. And we became the first professional club in Ireland, Southern Ireland. Mm. And um, it went well. Uh, I was there for three years. Uh, we won the cup, FA Cup over there. And we played in Europe. It was not like it is now. It was just, you know, the European Cup then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not like the, the tournaments they have now. It was a straight knockout competition. Um, we played Nicosia of Cyprus. We won that one. Um, I scored a cracking goal in Cyprus. Mm. And um, they wouldn't let me out of the country at the airport. They wanted to keep me, sign me. But <laughs> <laughs> what, because they hated you for scoring or because they wanted you to play for, for their team? <laughs> To be honest, it was a cracking goal. I've never scored one before like that. I just, uh, <laughs> I just done a little maze and hit it with my left foot, and he went top corner, and um, yeah. and they they really enjoyed it, and you know they wanted me to stay over there, but Johnny Giles wouldn't let him. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what could have been? <laughs> yeah. Um, and how how far did you get in Europe that season? We got through to, I think. Because you had the preliminary rounds and the thing, I think we got we went through two rounds, mm. and then we played uh, Bani Kostreva of Czechoslovakia, yeah. and uh, God, you know, I was only young then, but they were massive, from the goalkeeper to the centre forward, they were all six foot five plus, um, really wide, and they they hammered us, uh, four one at home and five one over there, and but it was a good experience, yeah, uh, you know. 
and, and, I, and I believe I say, and bear with me because you, you know, I, I am taking a lot of my information here off Wikipedia, so you never know exactly how true that is. Um, you can go in there, obviously, and you know, oh, you scored 500 goals for Leicester. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you uh, in you you mentioned there the uh, Irish Cup victory. Um, you had a big part in the goal that was that that um, that won you the game. Yes, uh, I went on a run, uh, cut into the box, and I was brought down in the box. And um, Ray Tracy took a, took the penalty from the spot, and um, we beat Sl uh, Sligo one nil. Of course, there was, there was no hint of a dive or no need for any VAR, was there? Well, the left back of Sligo, till this day, because he spoke to me a, few, a couple of years ago and he said, you, you dived. And no, no, I didn't. <laughs> Which he would, of course, say that, wouldn't he? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you weren't allowed to in those days, because, like, to be fair, if you dive like you do now, even, you, mm. even your own players would beat you up because it wasn't a thing that you used to do. No, no. Now, um, you know, it was strange, but... but you, you came back, though, and you actually came back, uh, dare I say, to, and I don't know what your dad thought about this, to Birmingham City. Yes, came back to Birmingham City. Uh, Jim Smith was the manager there at the time. Mm. Um, my dad had no qualms with Birmingham, you know, because um, I think they, they were a team that... Completely opposite to Villa, where mm. at the time Villa had been European champions and and stuff like that, and they were like a bit cocky, and the fans were a bit cocky and whatever, and you know, but I didn't like that. So yeah. um, you know, you knew you knew the Blues were down to earth, and uh, he was okay with that. And what brought what brought you back home then? Because you're obviously having a great time in Ireland. To be honest, um, I'm going back now. I was married when I was 16 mm. uh, and um, I went over on my own because my wife at that time didn't want to go over there mm. and um, after the two or three years, started to get a bit homesick mm. and um, I just said to Johnny Johnson one day that, you know, I need to go back home and um, he says, okay, then go back home, uh, try and find yourself a club and let me know when you do. And then um, I went back. Uh, my old school teacher, bless him, who was the manager at uh, Churchfields, who you know who started the journey. Yeah, he knew I was back, and he, he started sending letters and things around to clubs. Uh, I went down London to have a trial with QPR, and then um, I got a phone for call from Keith saying that Birmingham City were interested in. So I went to Birmingham, uh, had a week's trial there, and. You know, they sold me straight away, got hold of Johnny Jaws, and I think they, they sold sold me for six thousand pound. <laughs> what Shamrock sold you for six thousand. Yeah, Shamrock uh, sold me to Birmingham for six thousand. Uh I was in the well, let's be honest with you, we're talking what, nineteen mid nineteen seventies now, so it wasn't to be sniffed at, was it? Oh no, like I say he'd, he'd gone over and brought the club, um, because uh for all the younger people watching nowadays that the clubs in my time they depended on, you know, the gate receipts. There was no mm. big massive um, money pumped into the clubs like there is now. You had your sponsors' name and that, but didn't go far. So the clubs like had to rely on on the gate money. So anything extra was a bonus for the club. Mm. I mean, just I mean, things have changed obviously now. I mean, you know, we all say that you know as a I mean, it was Jimmy Hill, wasn't it, that sort of got rid of the, you know, the, the the wage or the maximum wage for footballers. I mean, he could have had no idea where it was going to sort of end up. And I mean, just the argument that a playing career is very short, you know, that it doesn't last forever. Um, but surely, I mean, they they are players these days. They are paid astronomically for what they do, and that's no disrespect to them. Yeah, I can't knock any any modern footballer uh, because you know it, they don't ask for it; they get given it. Yeah, but, um, you can see, and probably people might think that I'm talking because you know I, I didn't get the money and the big bucks and whatever. But you can see how it's damaged the game, which mm. from my age now, 
and the people that go up and we can, they can see the change. But all the young people now, they can't because they didn't know what football was like back in those days. Mm. But you you can you can't relate to the players like you did in our day. Um, they're not approachable, I don't think. I think um, you know you see them all turn up on on the coaches with their earphones in and things like that, and they don't they don't come across like our players of our generation. No. Um, you know, you could go out on a Thursday night in the pub and you'd be standing next to a footballer, which yeah. was part and parcel of the days then. But, it was um, usually Frank Worthington as well. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, when I went to Birmingham and Frank was there, and saw him there, man, what a hero. What a hero. Yeah. The guy was absolutely 100% from his toes right the way up to the top of his head. Fantastic guy. Yes. Yeah, oh, God. and rest in peace because obviously he passed away uh, uh, last year. You were at, you were at Birmingham. Was it three seasons? Was there three seasons? Um, I like I went there. I like say on the trial. Um, I got straight in. Uh, my first game was Man City away. I think it, I think it was the final game or one of the two games towards the end of the season. And Birmingham got relegated that year, but uh, I scored a header. Uh, on my debut, which I can't remember going in. I, I remember it sitting in my head. And then, <laughs> I was going to say, then, I think I don't ever remember seeing you score with a header. Oh, yeah. And then the next thing, and you know, everybody's jumping on me, and oh, what a great header that was, but it just hit me. You yeah. know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> but no, he, he, he was absolutely brilliant. And then um, I got to play with uh, Archie Gemmel, Colin Todd, Frankie Worthington. Oh, man. Kenny Burns, you know, you go through like a lot of fantastic players. Those were the days. You're taking me back now <laughs> through uh, the, the yeah. midst of time. And then you, you obviously, um, then that was the time I was sort of, I I was leaving school. I left school in seventy seven, um, and you joined Leicester in nineteen eighty one. How did that come about? That came out about really, it just hit me because um, I went in on the train on the Monday and um, Jim Simpson called me in uh, because I'd been, I had been I was doing well for Birmingham. Uh, I wasn't in the team all the time, but I kept coming on the sub and scoring. And um, I was doing really well. And he, he just said, we've had a, an interest from Leicester City. They want to, they want to sign you. Mm. And uh, would you go over and have a, a chat with Jock Wallace? And I went, yeah, um, no problem at all. And then... Uh, Came over to uh, beat, uh, meet Jock, and oh, what a guy he was! And he, you know, he, he sold me the club within three minutes, and um, the warmth he showed, and because he had got a rugged roughness, which oh, yes. you know, but he did know how to talk to players, and he mm. did know how to make you feel good. And I think he was a brilliant man manager. And um, like I say, he sold me the club within three minutes, and. Signed for Leicester, and I think they paid. I think it was eighty thousand for me. Oof, well, wow. and I mean, you said there he knew how to talk to players, but as a player, could you understand the bloody word he was saying? <laughs> to be honest, for the first six months, I couldn't understand half the team because they were mostly Irish and Scots. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Paul Ramsey to the day now, I still can't understand what he says because he's, <laughs> he's broad Irish and how fast he talks. I have to try and slow him down a bit, but. No, um, because like when I played for Shamrock, they used to play in the, the green and white hoops, didn't they? Yeah, cool, and, yeah. And I'd, I'd pinched the, the shirt when we won the cup final, which, you know, you, you couldn't do because we only had one strip for the whole season. Yeah. But I managed to keep the top out. And I think it was, um, oh, I think it was Paul Ramsey told, advised me to wear this in training one day. And, um, you know, <laughs> I know what's coming. <laughs> oh. Here I am in the gym with this, you know, we, we got our track tube tops and I took it off and got this green and white hoops top on. And I'll tell you what, Jock, Jock just let the players get me, you know, because they battered me. They did absolutely battered me. It was in the gym. And I'm saying they meant it as well. They were kicking, punching, smashing me against the wall. And he wouldn't wow. let me take the top off. He wouldn't let me take the top off. He says, you, you've got to be punished now for the rest of the training session. And oh, I came off black and blue, I did. Black and blue. <laughs> Literally, they were really. It wasn't. It wasn't playful then. 
Oh, God, no. And uh, the chief instigator was um, Alan Young. Bless his heart. You know, um, like you say, <laughs> Mad Rangers play and whatever. And, yeah, they, they let me know about it. I was going to say, because obviously Jock was at Rangers and had, and had won the, everything at Rangers. It was the biggest surprise sort of when he resigned from Rangers and came, came down to Leicester, which were then a second-tier team. Um, for those of us of a certain age, it was called Division 2. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but he was Rangers through and through, wasn't he? Really, but did you? I've got to ask you, were you part? And I think, um, if I remember, uh, you were part of the old, um, was it the hill or the mountain they called it? To be fair, I just got there just after they'd done it, um, which, which is a blessing, I think, to be honest, because the lads were telling me that how steep it was, and uh, he used to stand on the top with a stick in his hand. and if you didn't get up there in time, we used to whack your hands and send you back down. And their part of the training was, why I was there, is that if you weren't sick in training, you weren't training properly. Wow. So you had to be had to be sick to prove that, especially pre-season, that you were putting the work in, mm. which I can't see the modern days doing now. <laughs> well, we moan about players that are being ill in, you know, getting... Um, you know, muscle problems and everything in training. And at least you don't get hit with sticks there. But it actually stopped the hill, had he then? Because like I say, there's there's a there's a photos and videos of it out there and it looked my God, it looked it must have been knackered when it came to match day. I tell you, um there was times when in pre season he used to take us away uh, to the beaches and make uh, make us run in the sand and in, in the water. And um it was it was it was intense. I remember West Brom coming over. We went to Lily Shore for a week, and um, we started training at nine o'clock. And then halfway through the morning, West Brom would turn up on a pitch opposite at about eleven o'clock. Uh, Johnny Giles was like more of playing football. You had to work when you were playing football. That's where you, you got your spent your strength and your speed from. And then we finished five twelve o'clock. And then um, we'd be carrying on till about one, stopping up some dinner, and then back out in the afternoon. And that was pre season training for us, like up the hills and everything and whatever. Mm. And um, Jock, Jock insisted on you know being fit so you could last the 90 minutes. Because, mm. of course, those were the days of only one substitute. Yes, one substitute. And I think it was great for the game, to be honest. Mm. Um, I th- you know, um, I think he's starting to spoil it now with having. You know, you'll probably have 10 subs next season, the way things are going. Well, but, um, it's like, you know, if they have 10 subs, you know Brendan will only use six. <laughs> so don't get me started yeah. on that one. Yeah, we probably, we probably wouldn't use six. <laughs> but it meant you had to get it right at the start, didn't you? That's right. And um, I think that's why Jock was so good, because oh, well, probably Gordon Milne as well, because in those, in those days, you didn't go out and sign anybody for the sake of it, you went out and signed a player that fitted into the, the way, the style of play you wanted to play. Yeah. And I think that's that's why um, Leicester got its strength because you were always signing players to play how the team plays, and how you fit in. Yeah. Whereas you look at the, the, the teams now, they buy big names and then try and change the tactics to, the, to the, you know, the, the big name they've just got. In. So um, it was good. It was good for the fans because like, I think we only had uh, 14, 15 in the squad. And then um, you had to play through your injuries. I remember playing uh, and I pulled my thigh in the first half. I think it was against Tottenham. And I had a cortisone injection to send me through the rest of the game. And then after that, I was out for about three three months because um, all torn ligaments in my thigh. Um, that's, that's how it used to be. Yeah. And I've kind of said about Jock... Um, I mean, obviously, you know, were you there when Alan Young was there? Were you there at the same time? Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Young, Youngie was the uh, the father of the club. Um, yeah. he, he welcomed he welcomed me into the club because he uh, um, he had, he absolutely adored. In fairness, Jock Wallace, he wouldn't have a word said against him. And um, so, I mean, what I mean, did was it a case of practical jokes when you arrived? Was it you know? Itching powder in the underpants and what have you, or when you say he welcomed you, was it a, was it a nice welcome? <laughs> I'll tell you what, was it a brilliant welcome? Um, because um, they were they were like a family, 
Mm. Um, you know, uh, like you say, nobody say a, a bad word against uh, Jock, but nobody say a bad player against any of the players. Mm. And I think um, that in the, our day, um, that's why we were so strong. And because you had you had the nucleus of a lot of Scottish players there, it it helped. It helped in a way because like you came, you were coming into a family. Mm. They were you know, and, and they welcomed you. They welcomed you, and there was no no stars, no um, egos. It was just like a you know um, a, a machine. Really, you you were just a part in a machine for them. Yes, yeah. And I've got to ask you. Obviously, Jock Wallace, Leicester City, FA Cup run. Um, you, you, you're four foot nothing, but you. <laughs> it's, the, it's the only time I think still in history where a team had three different goalkeepers on um, <laughs> in the one game. Obviously, we had Mark Wallington who got injured but tried to get on. This, of course, was the Shrewsbury uh, quarterfinal, which I wasn't able to go to because I was going to. I was switching with a co-worker. And she would go to one week game, I would go to the next, and we'd do it in runs. But I did get to go to the semi final, which unfortunately we lost, obviously, to uh, those who must not be mentioned from North London. Yes, yes. I'll mention them. <laughs> that, that, that game, I can remember because I worked the time I worked for W8 Smiths, and we could hear the cheering when, you know, when we came out because the game was still going on. But Mark Wellington got injured. Uh, tried to carry on because he'd gone numerous games without sort of not playing and he obviously didn't want to come off. Youngie went on, uh, went up for a ball and seemed to sort of fall over the defender and hurt himself, obviously, when he fell. Now, like I say, you're not the tallest player, I'm sure, in that squad at the time. How mm. come you, you were picked to go in goal? I think... Um... In training, I used to mess about a bit and like, before training started. You know, I was get the gloves on and people would shoot at me and whatever. Mm. And um, I've done a couple of good saves, to be honest. And so uh, they always said, like, you know, if you've got a problem, you know, I could, I, I could go in goal. Mm. But I think on that day of that game, uh, Shrewsbury were physical. You know, they yeah. were really physical. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. You watch you watch the slow motion tackle that Bates done on uh, Wellington. And if you, if you slow it at really slow motion, you can see the big chunk of his thigh flying through the air where he's left a big hole in his thigh. And um, they were, you know, they were tough. They were tough physical. And yes. I think he wanted a big fella in goal because, you know, he was either this way or that way in the game. It could have gone either way. Mm. And then um, when he got injured, that was my chance. I went in. Um, I did one good save off a free kick. Yeah. Uh, Told all my mates about it. Watch it on match of the day. This save, and uh, <laughs> when the game was on, they'd cut it in the highlights, and I was gutted. <laughs> um, typical, typical. But I don't think you or Youngie conceded a goal, did you? No, that was a, a question on um, question of sport on on TV. Uh, uh, there was a goal with seven, a game with seven goals, uh, which two keepers didn't uh, <laughs> not in a goal. Yeah, and uh, that was me, me and Youngie. Um, like I say, when he came back out and I went in, he went up front, got his breath back, and then um, Jock says, "Right, want you back in goal." Mm-hmm. And uh, he went back in goal. I put my shirt back on, went on to the right wing. Ball came out to me within a couple of minutes. Uh, run down the wing, crossed it, and there was Jimmy Morrow's bang, and that was just winning. I'm gonna, I was going to say you preempted me there, but yeah, you know, as soon as you were taken back onto the pitch, you, you set a goal up. I mean, you, 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 you're saying then that you were like, you know, you played in goal a bit in training and after training and what have you. Was there any bit of you that wanted to stay in goal or were, when, when you saw Youngie coming towards you? Were you thinking, great, yeah, <laughs> get, me, get me get out on the pitch? Oh, no, on the... <laughs> I had no choice because uh, even with the crowd there, you just heard this one big massive... Scottish voice shouting, right, next, get out, youngie back in. And that, that was gospel. <laughs> so, Fair enough. You, know, Fair you, enough. Didn't argue, you didn't argue with him. What he said was gospel. Well, Jock was uh, a, man, a goalkeeper himself, of course, wasn't he? He was, yeah. You know. Was. What, I mean, I can imagine, and I, I used to speak to, to youngie a lot, and I hope he's well. I know he's not, not been so well recently, but I hope he's, he's doing okay. 
but um for what again, it, it was a great motivator like you say you you know if he said jump you said how high but you he, he just had this way of motivating what was he like as a tactician like I say he, he was good because um he brought players for the positions hmm. and he he wanted you to attack people i think and he he, he kept emphasizing that the best way to defend was attack and then if you kept attacking people, the less chance they got to attack on you. Mm. And um, that's what that's what we used to do. And he always used to say and make sure that we we worked hard, we outworked the opposition. And I think over the three or four years that we did it with um, Jockey, you know, it, it proved to be good because, you know, Liverpool couldn't beat us. We were there okay. both with you. And some other big clubs, Arsenal, Tottenham at the time, we, we, we beat we beat all of them as well. So we were unlucky. We just weren't that consistent enough to, you know, stay in the top top positions. But it was hard then because every team was hard to play against. Mm. But I think that that season, although we came straight back down, I think you were mentioning Liverpool there. I think who were probably was it Shankly at the time, or had he moved on for Paisley? Yeah. Yeah, uh, but uh, right? But I think we 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 actually beat them home and away. We were the first team to win at Anfield for however many seasons, and the first team to do the double over them. Uh, and I think that season as well. I think we beat them two one in one game and scored all three goals, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and I remember. Uh, I think it was a Tuesday night when we played at Filbert Street. We drawed three each, and um, I scored an absolute cracker in that game. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did have it on um, the old um, tapes, you know, the um, VHS. VCR yeah. tapes. Yeah. And um, I gave it to my mum and dad to keep for me. And my dad, bless him, um, because, like, he was too idle to have uh, a new tape. You, you could put tape over the back and um, where he brought the thing off uh, to yeah. stop it taking over. He put some tape over it. And he used to tape all the birds in the garden. And then... Um, <laughs> I went round there. That went round there one week to get the tape, and um, there it was taped over. As soon as I put it in, you got sparrows and you got bloody robins and you got magpies. And- oh, when you <laughs> yeah. said, "I'm sorry," when you said birds for a minute, I thought you meant. Oh yeah. Uh, come and have a look at my son playing football. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have minded if it was the other sort, but you know. <laughs> The only tits you got to see was blue tits and things like that, and one of the little tits. Yeah. Like but yeah, but proper proper birds, we should say, yeah. as in the feathered variety. Um, I remember you saying when we did have a chat once, and you were saying about. I mean, it was so different then, and I always remember a scene in the um, obviously the film about Brian Clough being at Leeds, the Damned United, where Brian Clough was actually polishing the ashtrays, and each player had an ashtray next to his. Uh, you know, towel or whatever in the changing room. I mean, you can't imagine that these days, can you? I remember you gave it a story about uh, Mark Wallington uh, smoking when he was listening to a to a team talk. Oh yeah, because like um, the dressing room was right, really small then, and you had the toilet just at the end. And Mark Wallington at half time and then whatever, and the beginning of the game used to sit on the toilet. You could see his knees, you know, sticking out from the wall because the door was open. But he'd sit yeah. on there with a cigarette while Jock was giving the team talk. <laughs> And that was that was in the changing room. Uh, um, different you know. times. But what a great keeper. What an oh. absolute great, great keeper. I always think I don't think he ever got the credit he deserved. I don't think so because um, you know, he, he was following some good goalkeepers, that when he Gordon Banks and Shilton mm. was around and you know, Ray Clements, people like that. And I think I think he was if not as good or better. Because um, he just didn't get the breaks like, you know, no. pe- people do in football. And I think it was like being there at the the right place but the wrong time. Mm. I mean, it, obviously, it's two huge names to follow at the club. Uh, but, I mean, he always got on. I can remember being, you know, stood behind him in the cop, in, you know, when we are playing and having a, a chat about his bold patch, not thinking that sort of all these years later I'd have my own under that, you know. Uh, but uh, he, he he was, a, you know, I mean, you looked the other day at Aaron Ramsdale when he got kicked by a Spurs fan 
uh, for riding the fans up. But he, he, whether you were home or away, he, he just had. A, I just, I don't say I do think he was really unfortunate and and didn't necessarily. But a lot of that team didn't get the credit they deserved, did they? No, um, and I don't think it's being big headed saying that. You know, you had some um, great great players at the time, mm. and I think. Um, a lot of us were unlucky to not go further. Yeah. And, um, but it's it's one of those things. It's, it's it's football. You can't, you know, you can't go out saying how good you are yourself. You have to let people judge what what they see, and that's how it was in those days. Yeah. And and what was I going to say? You, you you played with some of the sort of from Leicester's point of view, great sort of fun. Mentioning you know my old schoolmate Gary Lineker. I'd, I'd, I have to drop that in every now and then. Because, you know, when you start a new job and they always say, right, say something about you that nobody will believe. That's always the one I use. Um, Alan Smith, Youngie, who 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 is your favourite to play with? You know, who sort of got you the most and, you know, knew where you were going to put the ball? And I think, to be honest, and this is what I try and tell my son, you know, no matter how good you are, I think you have to have a good understanding um, with your players yeah. and uh, your teammates because uh, you see a lot of players now, they'll take two or three people on, they'll get a chance to put the ball in, the forwards will make the run, then they stop and take an extra touch and that's where, you know, you get a lot of co confusion. But um, the reason me, Alan and Smudger hit it off is that if they know I was going down the line as soon as I got past the, the full-back, I was whipping the ball in. And uh, Gary always used to come front post and Smudge used to go far post. And, um, you know, we scored a lot of goals, a lot of goals between us. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I, he I heard a story that um, Jim Melrose wasn't always the most popular. Well, to be fair, he was another one as well, you know, that came down from Scotland. Yeah. But he wasn't like, he wasn't like in the... Um, the Rangers clan, because I think he come from was it St Pat's, is it St Patrick up there? Right. And um, big, big Alan Young and Jimmy didn't didn't hit it off. Uh, you can, you can guess where the story came from, then, can't you? From yeah. that, <laughs> yeah. And uh, they didn't see eye to eye, but um, Jimmy was a good player, a good finisher. Mm. But uh, you know, I think I, I'm. <sighs> I don't want to say that Alan or anybody or any other lads had an influence of what you know, on Jock or whatever, but no. I think Jock could see that they weren't getting on them, whatever. And I think in the end, I think uh, they sold Jimmy to was it Coventry? Yes. Jimmy Coventry, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, we got. I could be. We mentioned the, uh, the 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 famous quarter final, but I can remember going on the train to Villa Park. Uh, for the semi-final, the day I think it was that I remember the Sun headline on the newspaper that day saying uh, it's war because the the Argentinians had invaded the Falklands at the same time, and of course they'd got a couple of Argentinians, uh, Osvilo Ardiles and Ricky Villa, in their side. Um, it wasn't to be our day that day, was it? No, no. Um... We were bouncing because, we, you know, the cup run we'd had and the Shrewsbury game. Mm. And uh, we really, really fancied ourselves, you know, against them. But when we got out there, um, Young got injured early on. So, you know, his movement wasn't very good. Yeah. And then um, we did make one substitute. And then I think Young had to go off. So that left us with 10 men per bit. But it was just the day. Nothing seemed to go right. Um, the pitch was heavy. It was like playing on Blackpool Beach. There was that much sand on it. And, uh, you know, they got the breaks. Um, you know, we're lucky for Ian to score an own goal and that. Yes. But, um, you know, on, on the day, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but Glenn Oddle will run the show. Mm, yeah, yeah. I've actually um, got Ian Ian coming on in a few weeks, so I'll, I'm, I'm sure I'll mention that to him as much as he hates talking about it. But so was it... Um, I'm trying to think who broke the leg because one of our Tommy players Williams. broke the leg. Tommy Williams broke his leg. Tommy Williams, that was it. Yes, yeah. yes. And then he, he was out for a long time, and then first day back in training, he broke it again. Yes. So he, he was out a bit longer, but you know, felt sorry for him. But it was it was a great run, though. It was a great run. 
Um, and of course, then a complete change because Jock went back to Scotland uh, uh, and Motherwell. And talk about chalk and cheese. I don't think you could have probably, from the outside looking in, have got a manager at the completely other end of the scale when Gordon Milne came in. Yeah. Um, it was hard to adjust to at first. Like you say, um, mm. I think we had, we had the rawness of uh, Jock and the Scots, but then we had the calmness of um, Gordon Milne when he came in. Mm. And um, he brought a few players in, and then uh, it changed. But it changed. It changed in a good way. We didn't lose anything that we we had with Jock. It, we, uh, it was just implemented in a different way. Mm. And, um, I think then, to be honest, that's when you seen Leicester play uh, better football. Yeah, and uh, that was that was a, that, that was a good thing. And did you did, was it um, Gordon that took us back up again? It was, yeah. Yes. Um, we had a fantastic run uh, towards mm. the end. Uh, Fulham were up there. I always remember the game because they were played. Uh, they were playing Derby. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, you know, you look back now. Um, I look back on YouTube, and that game was on, and the crowd were right on the line. On the, you know, on the line, and as the players were running down the side, there was feet coming out and kicking people, and they kicked one of the the Derby players and it was in the last two minutes and then um, the game was over um, we uh, we got promotion but then the, they put an objection in and they wanted a rematch um, we were as in I think we got took away at the end of the season on a pre-season thing mm. and then uh, we heard that um, it had been turned down and we, and we got promotion Malcolm McDonald was Fulham manager, wasn't he? He was, yeah. He was, um, to be honest, a great player. I loved him as a player. But what, yeah. a, cry baby, what a cry baby as a manager. <laughs> um, but I heard, I don't know if this is true, that he was one of the first people to ring and congratulate, but maybe that's just urban myth. He did, but uh, he, made a lot of, uh, he made a lot of it to try and get a replay, which mm. I, don't, I don't think they deserved. Um, you know, if you're going to win the game, you win it in the time allotted. It was only two um, minutes, I think, wasn't it? That was... money, it's two minutes, but you know, you, you look at the crowds in them days. Um, mm. They they came from everywhere, yeah. and it was absolutely rammed and rammed, and no, they couldn't stop the game, or they'd never got it restarted uh, yeah. to to get the crowd back behind the wall. But they just let it play on for the last five minutes or something like that. But um, no. And, and, um, um, was it this time when when you did your famous uh, as I put in the um, in in the post advertising this when you became an Olympic swimmer? Yes, under Gordon Milne, yeah. Um, yeah. We played in Southampton, and I tell you, what, the the, ever, uh, the weather, it, the heavens just opened, and it came down and down and down, and we'd started the game, and it was just like about three inches deep. You know, you passed the ball, and it went six inches. <laughs> and it was great at the time, it was lovely, we were really enjoying it. And then um, the ball got, I was running with the ball and, you know, I got caught from behind and then the ball went one way and I just fell down onto my stomach and I just started doing the breaststroke to, to, to catch up with the ball. Uh, they kept showing up for a bit after. I'm going to say it's still, it's still a classic. I had it somewhere and I was I wanted to show it and I can't remember where it is, otherwise I'd have put it up. But, yeah, it's great seeing, seeing you do it. Because literally, you could, it was that deep, you could spread the water, couldn't you? Oh, it was unbelievable. But the funny thing is, when the game got abandoned, 10 minutes after it got abandoned, all the water had gone. It was so <laughs> weird, you know. The, the lights went out, the people went off and... The rain had yeah. stopped and when we went out, all the water had just disappeared. So it was just because it came down that fast and that heavy at that time. Yes. You couldn't you couldn't go anywhere. But ten minutes after, after they'd called you and abandoned the game, it, the pitch was all right. You you never thought of that as a another career then? Oh no, no, because at my time then they had the the budgie smugglers, you know, you didn't have the uh, the big knee length shorts now and I couldn't fancy myself. <laughs> In the budgie yeah, the budgie smugglers, budgie smugglers are really we used to wear them days are like really really small and tiny and tight. Yeah. So, and and again, you may correct me on this one, but according to Wikipedia, 213 appearances for Leicester, 
57 goals. You were the Riyad Mahrez of your day, weren't you? Um, oh, I, I actually think you were. That's what I think of you as. <laughs> um, I wasn't as skillful as him, to be honest. Well. Uh, but like you say, uh, modern football now is different. But um, I was brought up from an early age that you give 100%. And I think if you give 100%, even if you have a bad game, then the fans can put up with that. They'll yeah. they'll accept that because, uh, you know, you, you see that you're trying. And I think that's the frustration now with the current times at Leicester at the moment. You know, the players are there, the good players, but mm. they don't give enough satisfaction to the fans. And I think that's, you know, that's where the, uh, the frustration is coming from. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a bit of a strange um, thing because Gordon Mill moved upstairs yeah. and Brian Hamilton was sort of running the, the, the show and that didn't really work out, did it? No. Um, like I said, I'd been there um, six, seven years. I'd got play of the season. Um, we played the first game of the season. I can't remember who it was against. I'd done well, but got man of the match. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, I got called in on a Monday after training and he told me I wasn't in his plans. And that was me, uh, you know, gutted, absolutely gutted because it came from nowhere, uh, you mm. know, because I've been doing well. Uh, I was enjoying my time there. He then he just turned up and said, you're not in my plans. And that was me gone, finished. Wow. I, um, I went out on loan to Birmingham City. Mm. Um, I was getting some good, good reviews there. I was playing really well for Birmingham. Uh, Leicester were having a bad time, and then uh, I got recalled off the, off the loan. Uh, period. Uh, we played West Ham away. Uh, I scored, and then I went into Gordon Mill on the Monday. So I cannot play for this geezer, and uh, I was sold to uh, West Brom the next day for I think it was six thousand pound. I mean, what? Because Brian Hamilton, he, 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 he's not remembered as one of our most successful managers, was he? I mean. Did he replace? Who did he replace you with? Um, I think Tony Seeley came in. Uh, oh. He had Tony Seeley and he had Ian Banks, and uh, they, they seemed to be the, the, the two wingers that he preferred. Yeah, and um, like I say, I never, and that's the thing that hurt me the most. I never got to say to to the fans or anything because I don't think a lot of the fans knew what had gone on in the background. No, and um, you know. Um, because I absolutely loved it there, and it was great, and it came as a big, big shock. But what can you do? I know. It, it, it's almost sometimes when a new manager comes in, they've just got to put their own mark on the team. Yeah, and that was one of the things when Claudio came in, you know, after Nigel Pearson. He didn't, t- well, he's known as the Tinker Man, but he didn't sort of, you know, drop everybody and bring his own players in immediately. And I just think when you've, you know, when you've got somebody playing well and then the manager does that, then I think you've got to question sort of the, the, the manager themselves, you know. But but you are back to your hometown club. Yes, uh, went back there. Um, that was under. Um... Ron Atkinson, um, you know, big Ron as you go through the the Man United and everybody saying what a great manager he was, but I found completely different when I went to West Brom. Um, was that post Man United, wasn't it for him? Yeah, yeah. No, well, um, we didn't get on, and then uh, I uh, I went and signed for Cardiff, then my last club. Mm. You were you were. You were quite was it uh, two seasons at Cardiff? Two seasons at Cardiff. Um, I'd signed a, a four year deal. Um, I used to still live up here and travel down every day. Wow! And um, Frank Butters was a manager at the time. Um, he then left, and uh, I can't remember his name. Who took over? But um, he started to get rid of all the um, the oldish players that were in the team. I think we played Bristol City on the Saturday. We lost two one. And he said, right, I want you in training on the Sunday. And then um, I travelled down on the Sunday, two hours to get there. And uh, we had a we had a talk, team talk for 10 minutes. And he says, I'll see you tomorrow. And then I thought to myself, I've had enough. Um, I think I was 32, 33 then. Mm. And I, I just decided to quit. Uh, quit halfway through the contract. Uh, went straight into the pub business. And 
I had to pay £500 fee for international clearance to play for the pub team because Cardiff held my contract for, <laughs> for the last two years. So, oh, that's, a, that's a class, isn't that? That's a classic, that one. You had to pay, pub, to pay the pub team and you had to get international clearance. Yeah, because you know, um, because they kept my contract and they wouldn't let me sign for anybody else because I I just walked out. I said, that's it, me. I'm finished, retired. Mm. And, I suppose uh, there comes a time, doesn't there, when you you just know? I think so. I think, uh, you, you know, you look at Ronaldo and oh, bless him, I think uh, he, he should have got out a couple of years ago when he was still sharp mm. and, and I don't think he would have had uh, the beast in his head from... You know, from his last last season or last few games at Man United and mm. before then, and I thought I always watch the TV and you know you see old singers on the telly and you see old dance and you think, why are you still doing it? You know, um, and you know you try and leave, you try and leave where you've still got a bit of level where you you know you used to play. Yes, yeah, um, and uh, pub business. Enjoy it, not enjoy it. Yes, I did enjoy it. Um, mm. You know, um, I did that, and then while I was in the pub business, um, I went into security. Uh, I was a store detective for British Armed Stores. Okay, um, absolutely love that. What a great job that was. Mm. Um, you, the people, you know, no disrespect to people or whatever, but. Uh, we caught a couple of doctors. We caught a policeman. We caught teachers, you know, wow. um, and uh, it was it was, was eye opening, and that was good. And then uh, my brother started up his own business, and he went into the um, exhibition business. And then um, he said they were looking for some painters, and can I help him out for a week? And I went there for a week. Totally enjoyed it, to be honest, and mm. ended ended up doing that for the next twenty odd years. Right. Um, and I've got to say, at what point, and, and we, I love this from for you, because on the prediction show, it doesn't matter, well, it didn't up until recently, who Arsenal and Tottenham were playing, you went for the uh, the opposition just because it was Arsenal and Tottenham. When did your hatred, of the, maybe hatred's a bit, a bit strong, but where, where, where did your dislike for those two teams come from? When I was playing against them, to be honest, um, mm. You know, it, it was the arrogance at the time uh, because they were London clubs. They were thought, you know, uh, there was no clubs from London upwards. Yeah, you know, it was um, it was like a, a thing, and there was an an, an arrogance uh, that was there. Mm. And um, I had a couple of runnings. I had a couple of Garth Crooks. I had a run in there. I had a a run in with I think it was um, Kenny Sampson at Arsenal. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and to be honest, and no disrespect and whatever, but. And I always tell this to my son. You see, you see t- people on the TV that play for England and things, you know, and you you grow up watching them, and then you're on the pitch playing against them, and you think to yourself, God, how does this guy play for England? Yeah, because you know, and um, I might be dis- disrespectful saying that, but you know, me playing Arsenal was one of the easiest games I've ever had because Kenny Sampson was good at going forward, but he was crap at defending. And when you got in his face and went past him, you know, it was great for me. Yeah. And, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I expect that you sort of keep an eye on West Brom as well. But you've seen where Leicester have gone. Did you ever think you'd see us win the Premier League, win the FA Cup? I mean, you came, you know, that close under, you know, when you, when you were there. But um, are, are, we be, are we becoming a little bit too... Blinded by our own success, do you think, as fans? I think in the modern game, um, yes, because um, you know, uh, like I say, a lot of the people now haven't seen the hardship of before, and uh, the older generations, like myself and whatever, that have seen the bad times, um, can remember there's more bad times and good times. Yeah, but um, Leicester seemed to have that great journey for three or four years where nothing went wrong. To be honest. Um, you could see the you could see the train starting, and you could see where the trains finished. And I think it was I never saw it coming to be honest. Uh, winning like everybody else, winning the Premiership, but they just grew and grew and grew in strength. And I think 
that was a good thing for them, but a bad thing as well, because they had um, a system and a style which won them the Premier League and they had the players playing together doing it. Mm. But then after that, you start to try and change things. And then when you start to try and change things, that's when the wheels started to wobble on the, on the, you know, on the journey. And I think, yeah. you know, um, they let a lot of good players move on. And they say, like say, in the modern game now, they went for a few other people just because of the name of the person and mm. and and you know you, that's what that's what happens a lot of the time. Yes. Yeah, and just to, just to let people know, and one of the first shows they ever did with you, we did the watch along. Do you remember for the Leicester Nottingham Forest FA Cup match? Yeah. And which uh, which we I always blame you for the fact that we lost. <laughs> it was a bad omen. But I've got to say, good news is Nottingham Forest have lost the first leg of their uh, semi final three nil. So it does look like um, they are out. Um, football as it is though at the moment, I mean, it it's it's better than it was because obviously I can remember when I used to go down to Filbert Street and they had the pens. I can remember going to watch a game against Chelsea and it was a Friday night because Tigers were at home on the Saturday and they were in, their fans were blue and white, we were blue and white and they broke through from pen one into pen two where we were and and then Leicester went and scored, which was Leicester never do what you want them to do. But <laughs> Chelsea sort of equalised, and I remember going down at half time thinking, "I'm just not enjoying this," and I literally wanted to leave, and I couldn't get out because they locked you in. I mean, so mm -hmm. comparing it to there, it is obviously a lot better now, but it's no longer. I don't think it's, and maybe it's my age. I don't know, but it's no longer a people's game, is it? No. Um... Sky have took it over now. It's just a play thing for Sky. Uh, I've said this a couple of times on your show and wherever now, and you'll see as the time goes on now that Sky are making a lot of programs on the side to do with football. I think um, they instigated the um, January transfer window just to create a TV thing and a bit of mm. whatever. But you know, and all these stats they keep putting up and. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think, um, you know, um, me growing up and whatever, um, you always had enough money because it wasn't expensive. It was a working man's sport. You had yeah. enough money to go down the pub, have a drink, meet your mates, go and watch the game. And then there was excitement on the pitch and off the pitch. And I'm not saying, you know, I condone violence and whatever, but, you know, you used to get a lot of, a lot of aggro, not always violent, but, you know, no. uh, that, that created an atmosphere. And I think that's what uh, the excitement of that on the pitch and on and off the pitch was a part of football and it was great. But mm. nowadays, you know, it, it's all cool, but you, you have to sit where they tell you you can. And there's there's no, you know, um, I hate modern football, to be honest, because mm. every game to me now, and I'm, I'm trying not to be disrespect, disrespectful, but every game to me seems like Groundhog Day because every team now plays the same way and it's all about systems and passing the ball sideways, passing the ball backways. You can't tattle. And um, the worst thing that really grinds me is that you'll see a player go down holding his face, then they'll show you a slow motion of the incident and he's hitting under his armpit or halfway down the side of his back. And you think, yeah. you know, why are you rolling around holding your face? Mm. And, you know, they've got all the modern technology and all the modern health things now. They wear plastic studs and whatever. But every title they seem to make is a foul. Yeah. They're all standing there saying, I want a yellow card, yellow card. And then I think I've seen the record I've seen this year is 11 rolls when somebody's gone over and they're rolling. <laughs> Rolling yeah. around on the floor, and you think, oh, yeah, there's a stretcher coming on here now. And then two seconds later, he's standing up as though nothing's happened. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, it's like watching the old wrestling where you, you knew you knew what was coming because yeah. that's how they rehearsed it. And I think oh, it drives me nuts. Absolutely. You, you, me can't, 
you can't compare footballers with rugby players, can you? Because what rugby players get up and go off. But I don't know. I mean, I, I have Elton Wellsby on the show, as, as you probably know. And I, I love watching on ITV4. Unfortunately, I always seem to miss it. But uh, the big match revisited. Yeah. And when you see, I mean, A, first of all, when you see some of the pitches, I mean, they were it was they were like mud wrestling venues sometimes and we talk about the one you know when you when you played southampton when you were swimming uh so the pitch is obviously a lot better but when you look if, if they played like they did then now you'd end up with five aside and probably even less to be honest i i can't see you know they play on carpets nowadays mm. and uh you know, I saw somebody miss over the weekend or something, and he's looking at the floor as though it's bobbled. And I'm thinking, how can you look at the floor? It's a carpet. Yes. But, um, we used to play at Old Trafford, and that, and in September, there was no grass on the pitch. Mm. And, you know, you, you play on rock hard, frozen pitches and mud baths, but you still had a cracking, you know, the cracking games and that. Mm. And I always remember that for people, you know, just around my age when Hereford played in the FA Cup. Oh, yes. And, uh, I had scored that scream and look at the state of the pitch then. Yeah. But that was football. I know that was a football and it, it was a leveller. Mm. And I watched the FA Cup this year where the big teams go to the smaller clubs where they haven't got, you know, they've got proper grass pitches. And uh, they look like Bambi on ice. You know, you can see them. You can see the difference in the, the, the stature and the way they move and that. And yes. That's why I always like the FA Cup because, you know, the little teams against the big teams. It is, it is a level, though, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I always remember the uh, um, the, the Keith Weller goal against Luton at uh, that yeah. time, and what he did. But on the pitch, that that on that pitch, I mean, like you see, it, it it'd have been messy these days if he'd been playing on this pitch, wouldn't he? I mean, how he could do that on that you just said on those pitches, it's and how you guys played on it, it is is. Uh, is is unreal one thing you mustn't miss though we'll end on this and i do appreciate you coming on one thing you mustn't miss is the baths oh mate they used to be great you know <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, uh... to god you used to come off come off in the game and it was that deep it was like diving in the swimming pool and um you know you you'd, you'd have the odd things floating past sometimes but um <laughs> No, no, that's what, that's what I was worried about. Sandwiches, sandwiches and bottles and things like that that was in there. But um, no, it was great. It was, you know, you could. that's how it used to be. But nowadays it's that yeah. clean and whatever and anybody's scared of catching anything. And, you know, like uh, I had the the honour of like uh, when I went down to Leicester, they, they showed me around the dressing room and, and how big it is now. And, you know, and they got TVs on the wall that, you just go up and if you press the TV, whoever your opponent is will come up on there and he'll tell you who his favourite player he passes to and how many times he does this, how many times he does that. And uh, unbelievable what they've got at the what they've got at the you know things now. It is a different world, isn't it? It is a different oh, world. Unbelievable. But, uh, it, it it moves on. I, I do feel like with the two guys out of you know the Muppets, you know, <laughs> sitting in the box going like, oh, and I, oh, or Monty Python. You know, when I was a lad, I used to live on in a in a box in the middle of the road. And all that. But, uh, but we've we've been through this, see, and this is a thing I keep throwing back at people. I'd like to say, or like to say to the modern day um, fans, is that just try a season where you've only got twelve players. And you have got no transfer window, and see how the season goes out, and um, see if they like it. And I think, to be honest, they would enjoy it. Mm. They would enjoy it because, you know, and I can't understand why people keep going on saying that we need to spend money. We need to spend money. I've said before, if you, you know, if you go to the bank and you ask for a mortgage, and they say I can only give you this much, why the hell do they keep letting? Clubs spend millions and millions and millions, which they're never going to get back. Mm. And then, you know, so many players for 100 million and stuff like that. Crazy. I was actually talking um, to a friend about this the other day, and I said, if a club's in trouble, and you've just mentioned it, I think, there, it's a case of let's buy our way out of it. Yeah. You know, let's not look at what we're doing wrong that isn't helping these players progress. 
we must we must buy our way we must refresh the team and and you know it, it's like if you have a, such a, a player these days can have such a short shelf life. I mean, you know, the players that are in the Leicester squad at the moment, a lot of those were sort of, you know, in the, won the FA Cup two or three years ago when we were being lauded as one of the best teams in the, in the league. And you don't become bad overnight, but you've got to buy. And I know it's a case of keeping up with Joneses, but I do sometimes think it is kind of, it is not necessarily ruining football, but it's taking the the tacticians that side of it out. They're taking the individual skill out of it. Um, mm. I don't think um, you're allowed to at an early age now show. And my son proved this. He was at, he was at Warsaw for thirteen weeks, and um, you could see like um, I didn't tell him who I was, and I let him do it on his own. But you could see over the 13 weeks they were coaching systems into him and stopping him doing what he was good at. Yeah. And then I went up to the coach and um, I said to him, I said, uh, how long have you had these these players? And cockedly, he said, I've had them seven years. And I said, well, has any moved on? He went, hmm, not really, one or two. And then for some reason, I do not know to this day why I said it, and I felt a prat after. Yeah. I said to him, I said, well, have a look at yourself. And he turned around and said to me, well, who are you? What do you know about football? And I just said to him, Google me a twat. I walked off. <laughs> and then my son has come out to me. He said, Dad, why have you just said that? And I said, son, I don't even know because he don't know who I am. So, you know, but that's yeah. how I felt at the time. Because no, no, I, I, can, I, can, I can, you know, see where you were coming from. Yeah. Because if you buy a player now, and I, and I can guarantee if Leicester buy a player, it'll only look the same as what they've got now mm. because they play sideways, they play backwards. You know, they're not buying, buying individual players with the skill factor. And like you say, a lot of players at Leicester have got the skill factor, but not being allowed to play it through the well, tactics and the systems. Mm. And that's the, that's the problem. The, the funny thing is that because... And, and do, if anybody's watching, do check out uh, the BBC Leicester webpage... Uh, yesterday for my Tuesday talking point, and I actually made it was very tongue in cheek, but just basing on what you said there, we've we've signed this new player, Victor Christiansen, and I've spoken to um, a guy from um, uh, uh, Copenhagen BT or Dem uh, Denmark BT, which is one of their, their equivalent of News Corp, and I spoke to uh, one of the guys that runs um, the FC Copenhagen Supporters Club. And they were just, they, they sold the player to me, literally. They, they were so gushing about him. And I wrote in, in, in my piece for the BBC this week that how long will it be until Brendan Rodgers uh, drags that out of him, that creativity, and uh, and gets him just passing around the back and, and saps the, the life and individuality out of him. And it was a bit tongue-in-cheek, but I can almost see it happening. You can, to be honest, and um, you know, you know, Brendan probably knows more than I do about the the, the modern game. But of course, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people that sit in the crowd and know exactly how we feel the same mm -hmm. because they can see the frustration. They can they can see. I took my lad to uh, a few years ago to watch West Brom, and Berahino was playing for West Brom, oh, and um, you know, he was supposed to be a winger with a bit of dazzle, take people on. But he got the ball every time he just stopped it and he passed it back. And you could see within 30 seats all around us either way, people screaming, take him on, take him on. But he wouldn't. And the thing I can say now after last, watching the last few weeks, you look at Rashford, he first come on the scene, he, ball, and he was brilliant and he was getting reacting back later. He was a great player. Mm -hmm. Then, then for the new seasons, you can see it was being coached out of him. But now, over the last few weeks, now he's come back and the goal he scored again tonight, he's doing what he used to do. And look how good a player he's looking now. And I think that people should look at that now and say, Boy, why does now Winger do that? Why is now Winger told to do that? Why is now players told to do that? Mm. And I think that's the only time you'll see a difference. Yes, yeah. Steve, it's been fascinating. Uh, I love talking about the old times, uh, mainly because I am old. 
<laughs> but I, I really appreciate you coming on, as I always do with the prediction show, which I have to say, um, there's a new leader of. Now, you know, I mean, Brad's been bragging all these weeks about how he's, you know, how he's doing well in the prediction league. Um, I really don't know how to say this. I don't know, it's so difficult not to look smug at this point. <laughs> oh, no, obviously. Mm -hmm. He had a you you beat him this week. He had a, he got two points this week. So if you're watching Brad, you know the, the, those that crow early, crow last, or whatever the saying is. But uh, thank you so much for coming on, uh, Steve. I, I loved I loved uh, uh, having these chats, and I love doing the shows with you, uh, Foxy Seven. Your your um, your new clothing range out at the end of the month. Yes, uh, it's not all sports gear. Um, it's stuff for everybody. Um, I'm hoping it takes off for me daughter and my son's sake because the barn idle and they won't do any job. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm too, too old now to re re to get any benefits out of it. But <laughs> well, we yeah. will we will help you push it on here. You know we will, and it's obviously on the prediction show as well. Which next week is going to be Friday because of the. Um, I don't know why it's because of what's happening. Oh, oh it's a transfer deadline day on Tuesday. Um, funny sky, you see, messing my messing my uh, my plans up. <laughs> but uh, right, but you, you see, when it, when they first done it, you had a, you know, you had an exciting program because people were buying players. Yeah. But now it's it's run its course, and you don't see anybody moving. You don't see no big names, no big signings anymore. I don't and, know uh, if I you remember. We 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 need we need the purple dildo back, don't we? We do. Do you remember that? Yeah. Just in case anybody's watching, it was a thing that happened on Sky <laughs> Sky TV. Yeah. But, but well, no, football, Steve, football football needs to get it, get itself back. It yes. needs to get back to the roots. It needs to come back. I mean, all that time when we had COVID, oh, we missed the fans, and and it's the fans that are important. And no, is it bollocks? I mean, as soon as as soon as we we got back, it was back to all oh, television wants this and television wants that. So, but it's yeah. a vicious circle we've got ourselves in. But um, I always remember it when it first when it first started. Um, I'd, I'd finished football work. We I played for Birmingham All, all Stars. Hmm. And uh, we played we played a game before a night match before their main game, and there was people with clipboards telling us, "Right, you have to be in ten, ten seconds. You have to be here in ten seconds. You have to be there." And I'm thinking, "Man, what's all, what's this all about?" And they they run it to the exact second, and you know, and we, it's terrible. It's, it, I think does, it's it does restrict the individuality. And uh, and the creativity of, of, of players out as well, you know. But uh, but there we go. It does. Steve, the thing the thing that sickens me as well is you got ex pros, a lot of ex pros now doing, you know, the commentaries and doing all the shows and whatever. But they will ne never ever stick on the football side of it. Stay on the football side. They will stay on whoever they're working for. They won't mm. say anything. They won't say anything wrong. It's like they're, they're told what to say, and so they don't upset. You know who yeah. they're working for, or somebody else, and you know the only one that does it is like, well, the two is, you know, uh, you got Graham Sooners and you got um, Roy Keane. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm just watching at the moment. I was about to say I loved. I think it was the opening match, Argentina playing. Um, oh, was it Saudi Arabia in the opening game of the World Cup, and them two having the argument at half time? That was more fun than the match. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But then, he was, Graham Sooners was scary. Uh, when you used to play against him, you could hear him behind you, grunting, trying to get you, and that was from 10 yards away. And, uh, what, a, what a solid guy he was, you know. I remember they, they, he... Sorry, carry, carry on. on no, carry on, mate. No, I was just going to say, because I worked for Blackburn Rovers for a while, and he came in as the manager, and... I was in sales. I wasn't, you know, anything, you know, <laughs> a player or anything, but in sales. And they just came around and introduced him to sort of, you know, all the staff. And my God, I was like, I was shaking when I was literally shaking his hand, but I was literally shaking because he just had that presence about him. Yeah. That's it. That's, that's, that, that was him. That was, that was the guy. Yeah. But um, that's what used to make it good because, you know, that you, you're in for a battle every week when we played. No matter who the players were, 
Um, yeah. I remember when I played Coventry, I got smashed into the wall. And um, he came over and picked me up and he goes, uh, remember the name, Stuart Pierce." <laughs> and then um, 10 minutes later, I was smacking him into the wall and went over, remember the name, Steve Lonix. And, yeah, that, nice one. <laughs> and uh, you shake your hands. You know, I was a wing. I was a winger, but I broke my nose nine times. I had my ear ripped off. I broke my back. Broke my ribs. Had a few teeth knocked out. And Don't you back? Was, yeah, I was. We was playing Sheffield Wednesday, and uh, Nigel Worthington was the fullback, and he's coming, clattered me from behind with his knee right at the bottom of my back, and uh, he broke my coccyx. And um, there's nothing you, they can do with it. Has to heal over time and. I think for about four weeks, I was tied to a chair with on a rubber ring and I had to sleep on that chair and I had to sit there because the pain was unbelievable. It was like, you know, the equivalent to a woman having a baby. Even if you coughed or you moved, it, it was agony. Wow. Well, it's all part and parcel of the game then. But did you all come off at the end? I mean, we always say like, oh, when you're on the pitch, you give 100% and then you come off and you shake your hands and... Or did you still just hate each other at the end when the whistle went? No, you, you always used to shake hands. Um, to be honest, the only aggro we've ever seen is that uh, Liverpool came down to Leicester and um, because it was Liverpool, we only had a, a small players' lounge. Mm. And um, Hansen came down like and he wanted to get some of his cronies and they wouldn't let him in. So when we played at Anfield after the game, they wouldn't let us into the players' lounge. And I remember Alan Young kick, kicking off and that, you know, and Hanson, he, he got a beer from somewhere, Young he had, and um, Hanson put his foot against the ball and let us in. And we just threw the ball, the beer, and uh, yeah. it missed Hanson. Went all over his missus who was sitting there in the fur coat and everything and whatever. No. And, uh, kicked off there yeah. like a bit. You can, you can yeah. always rely on Alan Young, can't you? <laughs> you oh, man. Godfather. Youngy was the godfather. Uh, bless him. <laughs> bless him. Yeah. But, uh, but, no. but no, I will let you go now, Steve. Thank you so much for that. Uh, really enjoyed it. And um, I will see you next Friday for the prediction show. Yes, mate. Looking forward to it. I'll try and get a few more points. <laughs> you can catch. Brad is catchable. Brad is catchable. <laughs> <laughs> we'll gang up on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliant, Steve. Thank you very much. All the best to you and your family. And uh, keep us informed with Foxy7. And like I say, we'll give it a push on here for you all the time. Uh, but I will see you next Friday. Thanks so much, yep. mate. All the best. Yeah, mate. Bye Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks to Steve there. Uh, I love talking the, the old days of football. I really do. I really do. Uh, but as I say, it's because I am old, uh, I have to say. Um, I don't know I don't look it. You can say that. Chris, you don't look it. But, uh, yeah, I am. I am. But this, this is what's coming up next. Coming up next on Leicester Till I Die TV. There is so much coming up. We're not having a preview game because uh, we're playing Walsall, as you know, on at the weekend so in the FA Cup fourth round. So we're not going to do a preview game, basically because we don't really know that much about them. Uh, and it's different leagues, and we didn't do one for Gillingham. But we will be back Friday at 9 o'clock um, with the Question Time show. Um, we'll be talking all things Leicester City, so anything you want to ask, any questions, myself, Dave and Brad will be in there. Be sure to answer. Uh, we'll be sure to try and answer all your questions that you put to us in the chat. Uh, that is to Friday night at 9 o'clock. going to have a night off tomorrow. Then on Saturday... Uh, 12 o'clock, it's the watch-along of the FA Cup um, fourth-round um, tie between Walsall and Leicester. It is on the BBC iPlayer. Uh, and then at 4 o'clock, we will have the post-match reaction with myself and, uh, and Brad. Monday, uh, a new trio for a one-off because we're not going to have the Premier League review show, to, review show to do. So we will be having a special one-off. Well, hopefully not a one-off, uh, a new show, um, Room 101. Two Leicester fans coming in and they're going to be given four or five topics and they've got to pick 
a thing that goes in that topic, uh, and I will pick a winner to go into room 101, of course. Um, that is on Monday at 9, and then Tuesday, 6 o'clock, we have got transfer deadline day special and we'll be taking you hopefully lest away well have done some signatures by then fingers crossed we can but hope and then coming up we've got david Connolly. um you may remember the ex leicester player on that next wednesday a week today we'll be chatting with him and then the week after that we'll be chatting with ex-player russell osman so we've got some nice ex-players to coming up to chat with be sure to get your questions in on the night in the chat and we'll put that to the players thank you so much for uh watching and but thank you very much as well i should just say uh, and i do appreciate it uh and, and, and i had somebody message me uh just regarding this podcast is proud to be part of the talk sport fan network talk sport powered by fans indeed it is apparent we're having a bit of a, a switch over. You know when you switch phones over and you have to wait for a code and it goes from one company to another uh, and you're like, for, for about two hours, you haven't got any phone signal. You oh, what do I do? Uh, it's a bit like that with uh, with podcasts when you swap them over. And because I'm moving to talk sport from the, 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 where my uh, my broadcaster before, um, there's a few, a few teething problems. So... We haven't been live. I haven't. Well, we have been live, but I haven't put any shows up. The last one was last Friday's mid mid uh, mid season review. That was the last one that is up. Hopefully, this one and the two others that we did this week will be up. The quiz last night, um, the Price is Right, and the Monday night review show will go up sometime this week. So please bear with me, but the podcasts will will be back. Um, we just, like I say, haven't been able to upload any at the moment, but we will be. Doing Doing. We will be doing within the next, um, hopefully, hopefully tomorrow. Fingers crossed, touch wood, and all that. Thanks very much for watching. And if you have been listening, thank you very much for sharing your ears with me for the last uh, almost hour and a half. Thanks to Steve for popping on as always. And I will see you Friday night, nine o'clock. Um, for the, we might do a press conference show depending what time it is, but if not, see you nine o'clock on Friday for with Brad and with Dave for question time. Take care, stay safe, and remember don't do anything I wouldn't enjoy. Good night. This podcast is proud to be part of the Talk Sports Fan Network. Talk Sport powered by fans. <laughs> Thanks for watching Lester Till I Die. This is Chris saying goodbye and see you next time. for watching these videos are tremendous you better like them too or i'll be back lester till i die